So, um, we are taking questions from the audience, and uh, we'll hand those to our moderator, Ann Galloway. A round of applause, please. She came all the way over here to help us out. The cards and pencils are located at the refreshment table. And uh, if you have a question, you can just give them to Liz Schlegel. Look behind you and you'll see her. She's in a black top and she's right there. She's our chair, yes. So that's how she gets that job. And she'll get them to Ann and Ann will choose them or not, depending upon what Ann wants to do. So uh, we're gonna start with uh, deciding who goes first. The, the format is that each candidate will get three minutes to make an opening statement. And we'll ask questions of any candidate that she likes to ask the question of. And um, then they will have two minutes to answer. If Ann decides there's a rebuttal, then there will be one minute. I'll be the timekeeper. Again, this is why I have to, yeah, because I'm the new guy. Um, I have a paper plate that's a 30-second mark. And I have a red cup that's times out, OK? So um, we're, we're going to let them draw cards to see who gets to go first. Who got number one? Oh, you go last. No, I'm kidding. You get to go first. So, ladies and gentlemen, from my left, uh, current, uh, well, current House Speaker until somebody else is elected House Speaker, Shaft Smith. You know, these are all Democrats, so we like them, right? Because we're all Democrats, or most of us. Um, in the middle, Keisha Ram, who's a member of the House for six, third, eight years, all right? and uh, Senator David Zuckerman, who's been a representative and a senator for, uh, for a while. How long? All right. So Keisha went first. Uh, who got two? You got two? So it'll be Keisha and, uh, and, she and uh, David and then Shep. Good. So let's test the microphones. Hello. Can you hear me? Yeah. Rebecca can hear me. I don't know. Yeah. Oh, OK, folks, great. Um, thank you so much for having me tonight. By way of introduction, I'm Representative Keisha Rahm. I've served in the legislature for eight years. Um, and as some of you may know, I started in the legislature when um, I started my campaign when I was a senior at the University of Vermont. Uh, it was the start of the Great Recession in 2008, and uh, young people particularly were facing um, the back of the employment line, huge student debt, and not sure if they would even have a place on their parents' couches. So I challenged incumbents for a seat in the legislature, uh, wanting to represent my generation and be a voice uh, for our future as a state. Um, right out of the gate, I heard kitten with lipstick, not sure what she thinks she brings to the table. Uh, so I knocked on every door twice. I uh, registered hundreds of young people to vote. I sat in everybody's living room, and I won by the largest margin of any challenger in the state that year. So I'm used to being underestimated, and I think um, that spirit and that work ethic comes from growing up in my Indian immigrant father and Jewish American mother's Irish pub. Um, where I was sweeping peanut shells off the floor and, uh, and pitching in in the family business and just really figuring out um, what I could contribute while recognizing that when the health department came in or when the fire marshal came in, it was always a stressful time making sure that everything was in place. And I see a lot of that same spirit um, in your small businesses right here in downtown Waterbury. Um, we had a great opportunity to connect with folks uh, you know, just this evening, not that we haven't been um, before. I'm actually on the board of the Center for Whole Communities in Faiston, uh, and I'm always traveling through and staying at the inns and um, experiencing the business community. But today was particularly helpful just to connect with folks. And, um, you know, I was talking to John at the Stagecoach Inn, and he was just saying, you know, shoulder season has been softened even in a terrible year for snow by having the craft beer industry around. And that was confirmed when I went to go see Caleb Magoon at Waterbury Sports. And two guys walked in who said, well, we were just driving through, but we thought we'd stop and get some local beer. And then we thought we'd stop in and see what's going on here in the, the sports shop. So you know, just being able to hear from people what is making the ecosystem work in Waterbury. And you all are doing something right. Um, and then I do think back to um, you know, some of those early days after Irene. And you know, I can't help but be in this area without thinking about an experience that I had um, when I was at a board meeting at Knoll Farm in Faston up Bragg Hill Road. And uh, we were having our meeting, people from out of state. We had gone to volunteer with a local farmer and um, you know, helping pick things out of his field to get ready for, for clearing it after the flood. And this woman came up to us um, 
and she asked if we'd seen her cat. And she was almost in tears and not quite there yet. Um, and I started to ask her about the cat, about where she was staying. And pretty soon, I, I just said to her, it sounds like this is about more than your cat. And you know, she burst into tears and talked about being in a local mobile home park um, and struggling to figure out where she was going to um, put her child in school now that she had to move. And so, you know, I just think about those things that are right under the skin for a lot of folks still, uh, just really being, being upended. Thank you. You ready, John? Everybody hear me fine? Hi, my name is David Zuckerman. I am running for lieutenant governor in the Democratic primary, which has actually essentially started. The ballots are coming out in some towns already and, and shortly here in other towns. And uh, so I encourage you to, to vote either early or, of course, by August 9th. And I would love your support in this race. I've been a state legislator for 18 of the last 20 years, both in the House for 14 years and in the Senate for four. You may be familiar with some of my work uh, leading the way, introducing legislation around GMO legislation, which obviously uh, we have our GMO labeling law, which is the first in the nation about to go into effect within about two weeks. But I also was a lead sponsor of marriage equality for all of the years from civil unions through to when we passed it. And I really pride myself on putting issues out there that sometimes not everyone's quite ready for in the political class, but that in the public folks are hoping to see happen so we can improve our society for individuals and take on social stigmas or expand our economy, et cetera. And so I also take on issues like cannabis reform, which I've been introducing since 2000, including both our medical marijuana law uh, and now full-on cannabis reform, where, as we're talking about the economy some tonight, uh, the main reason to do that bill is around changing youth access and having uh, resources for drug issues and treatment and prevention and education. But it also, just as my colleague spoke about how beer has become an economic engine for some, uh, there are plenty of folks who would be interested to come to Vermont uh, where they might have choices of different flavors, for lack of a better term, of cannabis, and also ski or recreate and uh, participate in other aspects of our Vermont economy. So when I was growing up, uh, we had a garden. Uh, it turns out that that was a big seed for me, and I'm now running a farm with my spouse, Rachel Nevitt. We have Full Moon Farm. It's a business with about 10 employees in the summer, three through the winter. We grow about 25 acres of vegetables, quite a few acres of straw, which I was bailing today, so I'm a little exhausted tonight. I apologize if I fumble at some point along the way. But uh, working that farm, producing food for people, I sell at the Burlington Farmer's Market. And to me, producing food is in, in a holistic way. We have an organic farm is about thinking not just about what we can produce today and for whom, but also how are we treating the soil and how are we leaving it for the next generation of farmers. And for me, in my political role, whether it was marriage equality, end of life choices, GMO labeling, livable wages, affordable housing, to me, all of these issues are not just about today and how we're helping people today, but how are we thinking about our future and not just in the two-year electoral cycle, but actually in the 15, 50, and 100-year cycle. And as a farmer, that's the way I think. I don't know who heard today on public radio that tonight's full moon on the solstice, it's actually the next time that's gonna happen is not for another 80 to 90 years. This is the only time this century. And I think sometimes we get so wrapped up in the short-term thinking when also we need to be thinking long-term and putting ideas out there for where we're gonna be in the long-term. Thank you. My name's Shap Smith. I grew up up the road in Elmore and Walcott and went to school in Morseville. Had the opportunity when I was growing up to spend some time at the Partridge Inn. I don't know if anybody ever went there up in Stowe and stood behind the Hobart washing dishes there as I grew up and uh, realized that uh, there were some other things I wanted to do with my life uh, rather than wash dishes for the rest of my life. Um, I am very proud to be uh, uh, living back in the community that I grew up in with uh, my two kids and my lovely wife and um, you know working in Burlington and uh, the, my wife works in Stowe and you know part of the reason that we've been able to come back to Vermont both of us left for a little while is because of the incredible public education system that we have and the opportunities that we both got me at, at uh, People's Academy middle level and People's Academy and my wife at Stowe High School the reason that I actually am starting off talking about that is that we're going to talk about economic development today and how the economy is doing. And 
part of how the economy is doing has a lot to do with the investments that we make in the state. And part of the investments that will allow us to be successful are investments in our kids, making sure that they can climb out of child poverty and that they have early childhood education. And it's investments in our downtowns. I remember the day after Tropical Storm Irene walking Randall Street with Liz Schlegel and Tom Stevens and seeing the wreckage and understanding that it was going to take government investment for us to restore Waterbury to the kind of community that it was. And that was just one example of where we had to invest throughout the state. And look at what has happened. We are in an incredible reinvigoration of our downtowns. And when I come to Waterbury, I see the amazing work that's been done by the community reinvesting. And I'm looking at Rebecca Ellis right now, and Rebecca and Tom also went to the mat to make sure that a huge employer in the state of Vermont came back. And I fought with them to make sure that something like that would happen, understanding that moving the state office complex to a greenfield might be cheaper in the short term, but it would be much more expensive in the long term. Government has a role to play in making the investments that are going to create the economic development. One last thing. You look at our renewable energy industry. Part of the reason we have such a robust renewable energy industry with young people working and getting jobs in it is because we have had the foresight to encourage renewable energy development through tax credits, through standard offer, making sure that you have standard pricing. Those are the kinds of things that matter. Those are the kinds of things that I will push, continue to push as Lieutenant Governor. Okay, for the first question, um, I guess I'll, does it matter who goes next? Oh, okay, yes. it's all on me. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, Dave, I'm gonna start with you and sure. uh, you guys can each ans answer this question and then if you wanna do a rebuttal, we've got time for that. So just, if you wanna do a rebuttal, raise your hand, okay? And then you each have two minutes to do this answer and then one minute for a rebuttal. Um, Vermont gave a million dollars to Global Foundries after they assumed ownership of the IBM plant in Essex. Um, do you think this was a good use of tax dollars? If not, how would you have used that money? Well, you've taken one of the sentences from my closing remarks. Uh, oh, because gosh. actually, uh, for me, uh, when you're talking about a billion dollar deal with a company that's got even more billions behind it in global foundries and, and oil resources, I don't think our million dollars probably was truly the thing that made a difference to their returning or not. And when I think about the backbone of Vermont's economy, I look at our small businesses. You know, we talked about beer earlier. I uh, met the Looses earlier about their business that was here in, in uh, Waterbury. And my own business, a small 10-person business, those are the backbone of our economy. And the primary direction I would go with our resources is supporting our 3 to 5 to 10-person businesses become 5 to 10 to 20 person businesses. Because ultimately, those businesses that are rooted here and are owned by Vermonters are going to stay here. And they're going to look for someone to pass it on to, whether it be family members or employee ownership maybe when they're ready to retire, or someone else nearby who's worked for them who might want to buy it out from them. And to me, local small businesses are the backbone of our economy and will continue to be where our economy builds in the future for a much more stable long-term situation. So I would use the million dollars either towards grants or small loan, low interest loans to our Vermont businesses, much like we have through Vita and other opportunities, uh, and add more resources to that direction of investment. Thank you. Um, Keisha, why don't you go next? Yeah. So businesses like Global Foundries get a lot of support through research and development tax credits, through energy efficiency programs that help them reinvest their own monies into making them more energy efficient. And that's really the way to go to support some of our larger employers, um, to make sure that they have what they need to be sustainable, but our million dollars doesn't necessarily mean a lot for them. At the same time, it's more of a climate issue, and I think it, that million dollars became symbolic 
um, of what is the state doing to constantly reach out to our business community and say, we want to keep you here, we want to build a partnership. What does that look like without spending resources flippantly um, when there's the threat of leaving? We know that that's really just not the best way to keep and retain and attract our businesses. Um, I would be looking much more at reducing barriers for small businesses, um, for figuring out how we attract more startups, how we align our policies with the kind of future we want to create in the state. Do we want to be the small business state, the socially responsible business state, the climate economy? What does that look like, and how do we then align our tax incentives and our policies strategically in that direction? Thank you. Shep? So it, it, this is a tricky balance. I, I think David's right that the future of our economy is really going to be driven by growing companies like Concept2 or The Alchemist uh, or Keurig Green Mountain Coffee Roasters, um, that we should be putting our investments in supporting smaller businesses that are going to grow. But I can tell you that one of the things that worried me over the last eight years as Speaker of the House was whether IBM, before Global Foundries, was going to close. And I can tell you right now, we could have made a lot of investments in small businesses throughout the state. But if IBM had closed in 2009, 2010, or 2011, that would have been devastating to the economy of the state of Vermont. And if Global Foundries left right now, that would be pretty devastating to the state of Vermont. So we have to have some balance. We do need to make we need to make sure that investments are available for all businesses, but we need to also focus on the fact that, frankly, our economy is going to grow by supporting the smaller businesses that are going to become bigger ones. That is the nature of Vermont generally. We know that um, that's what's made our economy constantly revive itself. Thank you, Dave. You want to hear about that? Well, I just want to say that I believe I'm the only one that made it clear whether the million dollars should have gone to Global Foundries or not. Uh, and I'd love to know if the other candidates think it should have or shouldn't have, because we would love to have money for everything. But ultimately, we don't. And we have to make decisions on what we would do. And uh, I guess I, was, I feel like I was clear about what to do with that money. Mm -hmm. I don't know if the other two would like to be more clear. So I'm actually willing to put money for bigger employers if it goes to employer train, employee training, um, if it goes to making sure that there are uh, that the employees are hired. Um, if people, if that money is going back into the state of Vermont, I think that, that sometimes those investments are okay, um, and you know, and and it's a tough it's a tough balance, uh, but I don't think that we should discriminate just because one company, like a Green Mountain Coffee Roasters, is 2,500 and another is 20. So I think there's a bigger question here about having an enterprise fund that was four and a half, five million dollars that became a slush fund for the governor. Um, you know, we are the legislature, our job is to hold the purse strings, um, and our job is to spend wisely and not react moment to moment. And so the enterprise fund should have never existed in the first place, and we should be much more strategic about the investments we make because you look at other states that are in a race to the bottom with tax incentives and trying to attract businesses, and they end up spending a lot of taxpayer money um, without great result, as opposed to working on quality of life issues, um, workforce development, tech and telecommunications, and attracting businesses for the, for the reasons that are higher on their priority list for why they want to uh, relocate and be part of a community. Thank so you. I'm going to be the big meanie and ask the yes, no question. Global Foundries, yes, no? I, I, I supported it, yes. OK. Keisha? Uh, yes, because we were put in a bind. OK, thank you. That's helpful. Um, so next question, and it goes um, first this time to Shap. Um, should we invest in the hydropower dams? Why or why not? Yes. Um, I was one of the first state leaders to say that we should uh, explore purchasing the dams along the Deerfield and Connecticut River. I believe it was a mistake in 2005 when we did not invest in those dams. Um, and I believe that the governor then put his thumb on the scale to ensure that we did not purchase them. Um, it, the reality is that we may not be able to buy them solely 
through the state government. We may need to do a public-private partnership, but I believe that the long-term uh, benefit to the state of Vermont, industrial power rates, um, rates, uh, perhaps lower rates for um, uh, consumers throughout the state, and uh, because I believe there's going to be a premium on renewable energy and hydropower in the future, I think that we ought to buy them. Thank you. Um, Dave, this time you next. Sure, absolutely. I was uh, in the legislature back in 2005 and certainly at the time was an advocate for purchasing those dams and would agree with the speaker that uh, Governor Douglas really uh, put the squeeze towards, towards a no. But when we look at our energy future, and I've honored to have received the Renewable Energy Vermont Award as Legislator of the Year, in part because of my stance on renewable energy here in Vermont, and we absolutely should invest in it. When we look at our global climate situation, the, the absolute situation over the next 20 to 30 years is going to be a complete shift away from carbon-based fuels. And to buy it now, as opposed to pay even a higher premium later, and as the speaker said, possibly in a public-private partnership, because it is a tremendous number of dollars. But when I served on the board of the Burlington Electric Department uh, back in the mid-90s, we divested from Vermont Yankee. We invested in uh, hydropower both in New York and here in Vermont. And Burlington Electric now has some of the best rates in the state. Uh, overall, we have some of the best rates in the region now because our Vermont utilities have moved towards renewable energy. And I think we need to continue to move in that direction. So I'm a very firm, maybe I would like to hear more of the information that's coming out. And I, I've been vice chair of natural resources and energy for this past year. And we talk a lot to our utilities uh, about the volatility of their portfolio. And I was in Bellows Falls this weekend chatting with some employees at TransCanada just talking about, you know, maybe in the future the price of, of purchasing hydro is going to be strong, but in the interim, as that price shifts, uh, a, a company like TransCanada can balance that against their other assets in the region and can really um, float some of those costs and, um, you know, make it all work. And we as a state are not particularly well equipped to do that. Um, you know, we, we have locally owned utilities, and that's worked very well, but a state-owned utility is something that would be uncharted territory. I would really want to see how it worked. And I know a lot of folks in Wyndham County were disappointed because when a study group was put together um, to look at the issue, no one from Wyndham County was appointed to that study group. So we really have to listen to the voices that are nearby that are working at that plant about what they think their future is going to look like. Thank you. Um, Vermont's population is aging. A large number of young people leave for college and then stay near the place where they go to school. Vermont higher education tuition is among the highest in the country. How will you lower tuition to attract more young people to come to Vermont to go to school and eventually settle here? And Keisha, why don't we start with you? Absolutely. And big priority for me, I'm on the board at the University of Vermont. And what we should start by recognizing is that higher education is one of our greatest economic development tools in the state. It is the largest net importer of young people and talented professionals into the state who stay and contribute to the economy and to our larger intellectual and economic engines. Um, so I would start by saying that I have introduced legislation this year and in the past as part of a tripartisan future caucus to look at all the many pathways to higher education, certification, training of all kinds. And what we know is that through dual enrollment and our early college programs, we're starting to get there in terms of giving young people access to one or more years of college education if we lift those caps and let everyone participate. So just starting by helping kids get out of a K through 12 setting if they need to and have that experience is, is hugely important. <coughs> I was talking to um, to a young woman named Elizabeth who's a waitress at Arvad's um, who went to Harwood and had ADHD and just wasn't having a good experience and um, was able to use some money from her from a, a family member who passed away to go to Rice and from Rice uh, she had the partnership at St. Mike's where you get $5,000 off um, your tuition each year you've gone to Rice to go to St. Mike's and those kinds of pathways for young people where they see a conveyor belt to their options and how that they how they can afford that for 
for families as well is hugely important. So figuring out the cost of uh, what free tuition for at least two years of college would look like is a huge priority. Getting more um, manufacturing internship tax credits because not everybody is meant for college and there are some folks who want to get into the trades where we also have a heavily aging population. So figuring out how to support that. And then finally, looking at all of the alternative pathways that people might access higher education that we're currently underfunding or not um, paying enough attention to. And for me, that's reach up. Um, the reach up caseload is almost all folks who stay on the program um, and, and access from um, prison as well as through our substance abuse programs. Thank you. Um, Shep? So in the last couple of years, uh, one of the priorities in the House, and I think in the Senate too, as well as with the governor, has been uh, giving kids an opportunity, particularly when they're in high school, uh, to take college level classes so that they earn college credit while they're in high school. Um, this has actually two benefits. While we have one of the highest graduation rates in the country, we actually have one of the lowest aspiration rates of kids going to college. And what I remember when I was in high school and when I see when I talk to high school students now is that if you have the experience of what a college level class is, particularly if you're first generation, you realize it's not as scary and it is something that you can do. So dual enrollment and early college have been something that have been funding priorities for us in the legislature. This year, it was not enough, but we put $700,000 into the budget to increase funding for the Vermont State Colleges. And last year, we did something pretty novel. Working with the president of Vermont Tech, Dan Smith, we bought advanced manufacturing equipment um, using capital funds so that there would be equipment that kids who were going to school could use and they could work on it and it was equipment that would help them with local employers like GW Plastics and other employers. So I think we have to be creative in the way that we're making investments in our state colleges. I'm very intrigued by the proposal that uh, Sue Minter put on the table about funding um, uh, two years of school and uh, the uh, community college. And if I was lucky enough to be elected uh, lieutenant governor and Sue was elected governor, I would look forward to working with her on that particular plan. Dave? Uh, thank you, Ann. Uh, well, a couple things. One is I think it's really important that we, in, in our high schools, start talking a lot more about financial literacy and so that folks, when looking at going to university or college, also know what they're getting into in terms of the pros and cons between the cost and the benefit. And generally, of course, it's a net positive so long as there are jobs out there to go into from those fields after you've taken on thirty, fifty, seventy thousand dollars in debt. I actually hire folks who want to get into farming and they've done four years of college or university and they realize they now can't farm because they have so much debt. And they could have actually worked on farms, learned what a business was like, earned money while doing it, and would have had a better opportunity to start a farm. So I want to make sure we look at all the different pathways to a successful future. And it actually isn't always higher education. But I do agree with the speaker, and we all know the same statistics, that our rate of attrition to higher education, unfortunately, is uh, abysmally low uh, in the country. But I also want to talk about tuition. This last session, we actually advanced uh, legislation from the House side that the board of UVM and others supported to get rid of the 40% rule, which made it so that Vermonters would pay no more than 40% of the out-of-state tuition rate. And the university came in and said, we want to eliminate that so we can lower out-of-state tuition to draw more kids to Vermont. Uh, and we said, well, can we put a governor on the in-state or some kind of limit so that we don't all of a sudden start costing in-state Vermonters more and more during this process? And they refused, and essentially, the House version uh, more or less passed. Uh, we did pass language which would, put, uh, which would give folks with trades credit for that uh, in their higher education learning, so that also, when they uh, go to higher education facilities in Vermont, they start with some credits so that their overall bill in the long run would be less. I would finish with saying that, again, reforming our cannabis laws, the first money should absolutely go towards prevention, treatment, uh, education and law enforcement, but there's no doubt that there are additional resources. In the first place, those should go is the higher ed trust fund, so we can invest in a future fund to make sustainable long-term higher education funding. Thank you. Yes. 
I just like to address the issue about the 40% rule, if I may. Um, mm -hmm. When we removed the 40% rule on um, graduate level education at UVM, what we were hearing was in the business school, uh, there were a lot of master's level business students who were simply talking to other Vermonters. And while there's huge benefit to that, uh, most world-class programs allowed for a lot of, of networking and um, people from all over the country and really the world to be able to come be part of a program like that. We had a very diminishing um, master's program in, in business education. And uh, we were able to get the 40% rule removed two years ago. We had already seen that what happened. We just lowered out-of-state tuition for that program so that it would be competitive nationally and bring more students in. And that's, that's exactly what we're doing here, which we, we need to be part of the national market on higher education and attract more folks to the state who are going to stay. We all hear about the need for young people to come. Um, and that was a big part of what we accomplished through changing the 40% rule. Yes. Well, and I understand that for uh, post-secondary degrees, but for straight up BAs and BSs, we already at UVM are a huge percentage of out-of-state and out-of-country students. So I don't think uh, that necessarily needs to be our draw in the same way that it does in the graduate program. So I did support it for the graduate programs. I think that's much more elective than the economic needs of Vermonters to be able to afford our flagship institution. Thank you. OK, next question. Thank you all. Um, why do you think personal income tax receipts are down? And we're going to start with Dave. Wow. Uh, well, you know, there's no doubt that our economy isn't doing particularly well overall. I know that Vermont and Governor Shumlin talks about how we have more people working, but the actual wages of a lot of workers are not going up. And I can say as someone who is working every day while running for office, uh, you know, it's tough to make a living out there. Uh, we run a farm, some years are up, some years are down, but that's because of weather. Uh, but, you know, Vermont, there's a lot of myths out there, and the Public Assets Institute has a number of, a lot of numbers around our rich people leaving because our taxes are high, and actually we have just as many rich people moving in as moving out. Uh, we also have discussion about young people moving in and moving out. It's actually just about a steady flow in both directions. Uh, but I don't have a magic reason why income receipts are down, except that I would say the ski industry this last winter certainly was paltry. Uh, you know, this area it, you know, has a lot of support from the ski industry with big, big resorts, north and south. Uh, and I'm sure the overall traffic, I think, was down about 33%. So there's no doubt that that's going to be uh, an impact. Thank you. Shep? I don't think we have any idea why. Um, frankly, and we, this has been a uh, trend where personal income receipts have been sort of, they have not been growing as fast as we thought they would. Um, and part of it is uh, that W-2 income is not going up, wage income is not going up. Um, what's striking, though, is that our personal income, if you look at the median personal income in the state of Vermont, it is going up, and it has gone up for the last five years. So we, it, we're having a very hard time understanding why we're getting less in taxes. It could be as simple as this. The market was not doing very well over the last uh, 12 months. People took a lot of capital losses. And we have a lot of estimated uh, taxes that are paid and uh, taxes that are paid on investment income because we have a, a lot of people who are doing pretty well here. And uh, once they take those capital losses, um, we don't see as much tax revenue. And it's, all I know is the economists keep not getting it right. Um, and uh, it is one of the most frustrating things to be building a budget and in January on estimates, and then in April, all of a sudden, have them $20 million less. So, Thank you. Keisha? So having spent three years on Ways and Means, what we would constantly hear from Tom Cavett are warning signs that we have a very volatile tax base in Vermont. Um, that unlike many other states, most other states at this point, we tie ourselves to taxable income rather than adjusted gross income. We take a lot of the federal loopholes that people rail against all the time in Washington, and that makes it so that if you're deducting your gambling losses one year, uh, we're not going to see as much revenues come in. So, you know, if we have a more stable tax base, what that looks like is moving to fewer loopholes, a broader tax base, and often lowering the rate. So when other states say, 
we have a lower income tax rate, what's going on in Vermont, it's often because we have a much narrower base we're taxing and it's very volatile. So year to year, we end up saying, oh, we're short and we're gonna have to increase the budget and nickel and dime people somewhere else. But if we don't rely so much on property taxes and we move from taxable income to adjusted, adjusted gross income, you often end up with a much more stable tax base and our state economists have been saying that for years. So can I respond to that? Sure. Because uh, last year we actually um, did uh, cap itemized deductions uh, and so moved closer and closer to what's called an adjust, uh, adjustable uh, gross income. Uh, yeah, gross income. Um, and so we have been moving in that direction. We had gotten rid of the, uh, or minimized the uh, deduction of the local um, and uh, state income tax deduction. And so we've been moving over time towards that. The issue of volatility of uh, income is going to happen whether you have taxable income or not, um, because income is uh, volatile. Uh, it depends on how the economy is doing. And one of the worries that I have about uh, going to an income tax for school funding is that if all of a sudden you had a huge drop in income one year, where are you going to make that up for paying for schools? And uh, so that it, I just I wanted to lay that out there. Thank you. One of the things you're fortunate with, all three of us actually served on Ways and Means Committee, which I uh, <laughs> think is probably unusual. And uh, I served on Ways and Means the last two years when uh, Shap became speaker. We all, we all taxed money, but none of us have spent any. We haven't been <laughs> right. on the Appropriations Committee. Right. This is true. Um, but you know, really, when we look at our overall tax structure, while we have one of the more progressive tax structures in the country, we still have an unequal system that preferences wealthier individuals over working class people. If we want to see more tax revenue, then we need to see more people spending their money locally in this state. And the people that do that are working class Vermonters who go out there and work hard all day. And then if they make a little more than 10 or 12 or $15 an hour, they spend it here in the state. And so for me, if we want to see our taxable income, our tax revenues go up in the state, we actually should have our working people get paid a livable wage and we would start to see a much more stable economy in the long run. Thank you very much. While we're on this lovely subject, let's keep going, because it's one of my favorite topics. OK. Um, so uh, Keisha, what initiatives would you pursue to change the way K-12 education is paid for? And while you're at it, um, would you change any other um, tax policies? Well, I hope what you mean by that is uh, is pre-K through 12 education because sure, we're let's working, say pre-K to 12. Great, and we're working really hard to include um, access to early care and early learning um, in what we consider a basic education, uh, and we move toward that with the inclusion of uh, four and five-year-olds in our um, education funding system, and that's hugely important because often that saves us money in the long term. I was talking to another um, another waitress tonight at, at Arvad's. You have great waitresses here in town. Um, and you know, she was saying that she ran a home-based daycare out of her home so she could spend more time with her son. Um, and then he ended up getting, um, he, he was diagnosed with autism and she realized she had to send him um, to uh, a child care so that he could get the real services and, and informed based care that he needed. Um, so now that she's done that, he's doing incredibly well. Um, he's progressing. He's much more on track to stay, um, to stay at grade level, to stay in classes. And so, you know, those are the kinds of things that early learning help us save the money, save money in the long term with. Um, specific to moving to um, to education funding. Um, we do have a system right now where property taxpayers become the pressure valve, um, where if you're paying full freight, then you're, you're a smaller percentage. You're about one third of the state that's paying based on your property value rather than the, the almost two thirds that pay based on their income. Um, and that often means that you make a little bit more money one year and all of a sudden your taxes double. Uh, and that's a situation that we should not be facing. And that's why I would support moving to a hybrid income and property-based system where we're still taxing commercial properties um, based on uh, a property valuation. And we move to towards income-based payments for everyone. Um, it's really a way to make sure that certain people at the top, and not really even at the top, just above about $100,000 of income, don't become a pressure valve to say, we need more money the system. And we also have to look at the cost side of things. Thank you, Dave. 
Well, my friends, uh, Chris Pearson in the House and Anthony Pellin in the Senate, who both support me, actually introduced the concept of moving towards income-based education funding for all homeowners in Vermont. So it includes still the, the hybrid of business owners and second homeowners, that's based on property, but that the rest of us would pay based on income. And if the top third of our income earners paid based on income the same way that uh, those of us at the lower end of the spectrum or middle income end of the spectrum, anywhere under about $120,000, uh, it would be about an $80 million tax shift uh, of relief for ordinary hardworking Vermonters. But really, it's more than how we fund the system. Serving on the Education Committee for the last four years, it became very apparent, whether it's due to the opiate situation, but other situations as well, that so many of our teachers are now also primarily being social workers for the kids that are coming into the schools. And I really feel that we need to hybridize our human services agency and our education department in that if we had human services personnel based in the schools, where we have room because we've had such a decline in students anyway, that folks that live in rural communities would have more local access to human services and understanding the different programs that are out there to give them a hand up to get back out of poverty. But also, those children as they enter the schools would enter a familiar environment and have familiar faces. And so a school environment, which can actually be very scary for kids, particularly if they come from challenged situations, would become more comfortable, and then teachers could also focus on teaching and inspiring and being those people that, for many of us, you look back on your second or your third or your fifth grade teacher, and that person inspired you to go in some direction that you now are in, but they're spending so much time as human services uh, <coughs> folks that it's very difficult. And I think we would also save money, because by merging those services, we don't have to duplicate them. And so it's both financially better and I believe better for our children and our outcomes for our children, which is the ultimate goal with our public education system. Thank you, Shep. So it does, I, I actually agree with both Keisha and David that it has to be on both sides of the equation. We have to deal with um, making sure that we're providing education uh, in a way that's cost effective and that we are financing correctly. I was down in Williamstown a couple weeks ago and was really amazed at some of the work that they're doing. Um, the principal allows his office to be used for counseling one day a week. And what they do is they bring somebody in from Washington County Mental Health, and they work with the kids who they've identified as potentially uh, moving beyond sort of uh, some problems to uh, even more major problems. And they're intervening early. And what they've seen is in the last three years, their special ed enrollment is starting to go down because they're trying to get at the challenges earlier. And we need to reinforce that throughout the state. That's a real opportunity. And the thing that the principal said is he would like to see DCF working with the families in coordination with the stuff that's happening in the school because they can't get DCF involved until it's a crisis situation. So they're not getting that counseling earlier. And that would save us money. You know, you intervene early, you are gonna save some money. We do need to expand our, um, our education to uh, K through, th or, um, to uh, basically birth till three, because we know that brain development happens in the first two to three years, and that's where it's most critical. I just wanna say one thing about the financing. I think that we ought to expand income sensitivity to $150,000 a year. We tried to do something like that in the House the last couple of years, the Senate and the governor were unwilling to do it. I, don't, I think there are some concerns about expanding uh, to an income-based system totally because of the volatility of the income tax. Thank you. Slight follow-up? Yes. Um, just to be clear, the, the shift towards uh, income sensitivity for everybody still bases it on the initial property tax value. So that creates and would maintain <clears throat> that stability. But also earlier, one of, one of the folks mentioned that uh, folks at the higher end pay full freight. And I just want to say that as Lieutenant Governor, the language we use is very, very important. And I think everybody in Vermont is paying the full freight that they can afford to pay and that it's really important not to diminish that those that pay based on income are paying somehow less
for our education system when actually still as a percentage of their income they're paying more than wealthy Vermonters who pay two and one and half a percent as they become much yeah. more wealthy versus most of us that pay between 2.6 and 2.9 percent of our income towards our public education system. Okay, uh, Shap asks first, yeah. then you, Keisha. So I just, you know, in 2009, uh, when I first became speaker, when uh, Governor Douglas was pushing to cut income sensitivity, uh, we had to go to the mat so much that we had to override uh, a veto of the budget and the tax bill. Uh, so I have always stood firm for uh, income sensitivity because I believe that it makes sense for people who make under $90,000 to pay for education based on their income. In fact, I think we ought to expand it. The question is, if you expand it all the way up, is that going to create some real challenges for the education fund, a fund that we already have challenges with, with regard to whether we have enough money to pay for uh, education every year? Thank you. Dave, do you want to? Uh, no, well, we did it. Keisha. Keisha, sorry. Yeah. Uh, I just wanted to say that when you have um, middle class families, two, two parent households where both are working, um, and you hit that cap, and you end up paying quite a bit more right away, um, you just fall off that cliff, that does feel like a drastic change for people who aren't making a whole lot more income. Um, you know, my partner and I experienced that, that ourselves as young homeowners, um, and our property taxes tripled. And for a lot of young people that you're talking about, they pay for childcare, healthcare, and property taxes, and there's not much left at the end of the month to reinvest. And so this is an issue that we're going to have to address for middle-income families just as much as anybody in the state. Okay. Um, I guess we'll, we'll uh, who, who do I owe the first to at this point? I'm a little confused. I guess uh, I, I guess I, I, I probably owe Shap. So, what's the biggest <laughs> barrier to a strong Vermont economy? I think the uh, biggest challenge right now is uh, well, there are two things. One is uh, the lack of um, inf uh, broadband infrastructure throughout the state. I think that's really challenging. Um, you know, we're on DSL at home. Uh, my kids like to stream all of their stuff, and you know, I go and try to use the computer to work at night. And uh, it, it, you know, the arguments are not a lot of fun. Let's just put it that way. They're more interested in watching entertainment than daddy um, making a living. Um, but, it, but it's a challenge. We need, and, and the fact of the matter is we need more public investment. And if I have one regret as speaker over the last eight years, it is not bonding for, um, for telecommunications infrastructure uh, more than we did. Um, the second thing is that when I talk to employers these days, they're saying they can't find employees. And the challenge is uh, training uh, and, and pay. I mean, it's a, it's a real challenge. And so we need, I think, to expand our training programs. We need to work with our higher education system. But we also need to work with the, uh, the technical schools that we have. Um, because I think that both Keisha and David correctly pointed out, not everybody wants to go to college. But guess what? If you learn how to be a plumber, you're probably going to be doing better than an English major coming out of UVM. And so I think that you know, we have to understand that there are different pathways, but we need to get our kids better trained and our, and our adults as well. Thank you. Dave? Well, um, I'm going to echo some of those points as the I don't well, Shep employs some folks too, I think, at uh, the law firm. But as someone who employs working class young people, uh, I think certainly workforce training, uh, work ethic. We're, we're here in Vermont. We're Yankee folk who work hard. Uh, and I'm actually having a hard time finding people. And farming, obviously, is a hard uh, profession. But who look for the efficiencies and look for that next step. And we train them in the farm. Uh, and a lot of folks are um, not always quite ready to work in whatever the environment might be. So I think workforce training is a huge piece of it. I talked earlier about financial literacy. I think that's also really important. Uh, because I talk with my employees and say, you know, the food that you get from the farm, which uh, you get to have free on the side, so we don't pay payroll taxes on it, um, you know, is also an economic benefit. And sometimes they value that, sometimes they don't. Uh, but also hope. You know, I think a lot of Vermonters are really uh, sort of 
not feeling like there's a lot of opportunities and a lot of options out there. And as we spoke earlier, because I think we're nearing the end, about the million dollars, more investment in Vermont's small businesses so that those businesses can grow and have permanent jobs, not just seasonal jobs, for folks to have year-round employment, uh, that's, that's another arena we need to move in. But there's no doubt, I agree, workforce training is a, is a huge piece of it. Uh, there are a number of employers out there that are looking for uh, folks and, and actually can't find them. Uh, but that's also about wages. We've seen employment levels be unemployment levels very low, but the wages being offered are just not there to attract folks. So it's not just on the employees, it's also on those of us as employers to make sure we're paying a livable wage, that we're offering earned paid sick leave. I was a legislator in the Senate when I had a chance to go to uh, Washington, D.C. to lobby on GMOs. I stayed back because I was the 15th vote on a 15-14 vote in the Senate for paid sick leave. And we need to make sure we offer employees this, the work environment where they're going to stay with you as well. Thank you. Thank you. Keisha? So I was just in Weston the other day, and I finally had to say what I keep hearing, and can somebody please help me, is that there are so many uh, mostly entry-level jobs open. I was talking to the folks at Hap Goods, which is a great general store and cafe in Peru, and they cannot find enough workers to take their shifts. And then you talk to other folks who are coming to the state who are skilled professionals, have a degree, um, and they have a real opportunity cost to being here. They can't find a job that matches what they might get paid elsewhere in the country. And so what you essentially have is um, Vermonters being asked to take a Vermont discount on their wages while they're paying a Vermont premium on their cost of living. And it's becoming highly unsustainable. And so being able to not only invest in the training and getting people um, you know, the skills that they need, but not having people drop out of the economy for other reasons. And there's a lot of programs helping folks on all fronts with substance abuse, childcare, transportation, um, you know, access to, to education that's basic so that they can even figure out how to dress and, and put a resume together um, as they crawl out of addiction and substance abuse issues or um, are, for, are, you know, basically trying to um, get a job for the first time. So you have to do that work while you also think about what is it that's making people have it such a difficult time taking a job at their skill level. There simply aren't enough of those mm -hmm. available. Um, there is that opportunity cost where wages are higher out of state and we just learned um, you know, that the, um, the wage that it takes to truly afford um, a home, a, a, a two-bedroom apartment even in the state, um, jumped from $19 an hour a wage to $21 an hour. And so a lot of folks can't find the housing that's affordable to them to be able to take a job um, that pays them a wage that helps them survive. Thank you. We're going to wrap up with uh, two-minute closing statements, and we'll start with Keisha. We'll let you get a drink of water Thank there, <laughs> and then uh, and then we'll go with Dave and then Shap. It, this was wonderful to be with all of you tonight, um, and you did a great job. And um, I don't know if some of these questions came from folks in the audience or you have more questions for us. Um, it was nice to let the lieutenant governor candidates go first, but you all have a long night ahead of you. I hope that you'll stay in touch with me. Uh, we're building a truly grassroots campaign that's all about reaching folks one by one. And I just want to end by talking about uh, when I was first in the legislature, um, you know, a, a business owner, a couple came to me who were opening a cafe in Burlington. And uh, they had gone through the fire marshal, they had gone through everyone they needed to go through. Then the health inspector came in and said, you only have one bathroom, so you can only have 25 seats. And by the way, we're going to subtract your staff, so you can only have 17 seats, you can't open. And they, they came to me and they said, you know, we need some support. We know we didn't support you in the election, but we need your help. And uh, you know, we, I said, I don't know any better, but to try to make this work, we got the health department in, we had a hearing, we learned that it was about a pandemic flu issue that was a rare circumstance, and that there was a bathroom next door to them in another spot that they could use. And so we asked for a variance from the health department. They were finally granted it, and th those cafe owners were able to open on time, and now they own the space next door, and they have a bakery, and they have their two bathrooms. And so often what businesses face are those small barriers, are somebody, is somebody just willing to listen and think of 
no problem as too small to address so that you can turn around and make sure that the next business owner, the next family doesn't go through the same obstacle. And that, I believe, is what the lieutenant governor can do, is be a real connector in chief for Vermonters. I've been a preschool teacher, I've been a social worker for victims of domestic violence, I've been a community advocate in local government in addition to my time in the legislature. And that helps me see who the glue of the community really is. And that's our, our social workers, our small business owners, our people who are just holding the community together, volunteering like so many of you did in Irene. And so I just want to commend you for being such a strong community, creating an ecosystem um, that's really envied the state over. And I want to be there to support you in furthering that. Thank you very much. And let's work to build a brighter future for Vermont. Thanks. Okay, Dave. Uh, thank you, Ann. Uh, when I think about our future and I think about what we can be as a state, I often think about my 10-year-old daughter who just finished fourth grade, going into fifth grade. And I am haunted by a statistic that many of you probably know, that one out of six of our young people are growing up in poverty, and half of those are growing up in extreme poverty. And in this day and age, uh, I just find that completely unacceptable. And I think partly the job as lieutenant governor is to talk big picture, you know, not just solely little, the individual items here and there, but what are we gonna do in the big picture? And as a legislator, that's always how I've brought issues to the table. When I grew up as a kid, there was a poster on the wall that said, behold the turtle who only makes progress when it sticks its neck out. And I've been doing that for 18 years in the legislature, much like Bernie's been doing it on issues in Washington that we're all so proud of. Moving towards an agenda of economic and social justice, attacking climate change head on, not backing off around social rights and human rights and, and all of the challenges that we face. And so I was there for marriage equality when we passed civil unions and continued to introduce that. I've been there for our GMO legislation. I would continue to do that as your lieutenant governor, especially, I hope one of the three candidates up here tonight uh, wins the governor's race, but also if someone else wins, as someone who'd really challenge that person on the issues and what the future of our, of our state's going to be with livable wages, sustainable jobs, renewable energy. I'm very pleased to have been supported over the years. I've been uh, recognized by Vermont Children's Forum, Women Helping Battered Women, Renewable Energy Vermont, Vermont Natural Resources Council, and Vermont Businesses for Social Responsibility for sticking my neck out and being a leader on issues. And in this election, I've already earned the support of the Vermont state employees, who many of whom work here in Waterbury, as well as the AFL-CIO Executive Committee and the Labor Council. I've got the support of Ben and Jerry, Bill McKibben, uh, Doug Racine, and I would love to earn your support uh, in this primary to take on Randy Brock in the race for Lieutenant Governor so that I could serve you uh, in the future. Thank you. Thank you. Shep? So I can't believe, or I, I couldn't have imagined, in 1983 when I graduated from People's Academy up in Morrisville that I would be on this stage. Um, but what I know is the reason that I'm on this stage is because of the investments that were made by the people before me in the legislature. The investments in public education, the investments in the infrastructure that we have, the investments in, people's, in the people of the state of Vermont. I want to be Lieutenant Governor because I believe that this is an incredible place to live, work, and play. And we need to continue to do work to make sure that we can be even better. We need to make investments in our public infrastructure. And David's right. Our childhood poverty level is too high. So we need to make investments in our kids. We need to make sure that our public edu education system continues to be strong and recognize that we live in a different world today in 2016 than we did in the 1890s. And so we're going to have to make some changes around things like governance. And we're going to have to make difficult decisions. Throughout my time as speaker, we've made progress. We've strengthened the renewable energy economy. We passed marriage equality over the override of Governor Douglas. We have made investments in our infrastructure, our roads and bridges, and I've been proud to work with Sue on those particular items. And we've made progress by increasing the minimum wage and paid sick days. Not only am I often at the start of the issues, but I'm at the finish. I'm seeing them across the line. 
That's the person I want to be as your next lieutenant governor, bringing the issues that Vermonters care about to the State House and bringing them over the line. I ask for your support. Thank you. So we have uh, three minute introdu introductory remarks from each candidate. Uh, Ann Galloway is our uh, moderator. Please, she drove a long way to help us out, so please. She's the behind uh, Vermont Digger, VT Digger. Yeah, so you can thank her for all the wonderful information that we have available. And I'm sure she wants me to point out that she has a great staff. I do. <laughs> but anyway, um, what else? So we have three minute opening remarks from each candidate, which we'll draw the equivalent of a straws for them to choose which one goes first, second, and third. Uh, Anne will ask questions of one candidate, all three candidates, uh, it's up to her. And um, each uh, candidate will have two minutes to answer. And if there happens to be a rebuttal from another candidate, why, they'll have a one minute to rebut. Um, Anne's in control, so if she cuts off debate on an issue, that's up to her. So uh, that's where we're at. So let's, uh, our three candidates are over here. We have a great crew, um, not only the lieutenant governors, which if you missed that, you missed a great debate. Um, but we have, um, in no particular order, but I'll try to go uh, alphabetical, Matt Dunn, uh, Peter Galbraith, and Sue Minter. So give them a round of applause and welcome them to the stage, please. Now it's on you, Ann. Have fun. <laughs> Thank you, John. Hi. And who got number two? All right. Great, thank you. I'm glad you guys are saving the planet. So. <laughs> oh, wait, one more thing. Yeah. Uh, this is the yellow card, meaning 30 seconds left. This is the red card, meaning time's up. <laughs> Great. Thank you all for coming out and thank you for having us. This is an important election, both nationally but also here in Vermont. Uh, I grew up in Heartland, which is just south of White River Junction. Uh, my father was a civil rights activist turned country lawyer who helped start the Vermont Land Trust. And my mother was the first woman to go through tenure track and get tenure at Dartmouth College. Uh, and the year that I graduated from college, I uh, was elected to the state legislature at the age of 22. I served in the House for seven years while helping grow a Vermont-based software company. I then headed up the AmeriCorps VISTA program under the Clinton administration, came back, served two terms in the State Senate, and for the last eight and a half years, I was bringing Vermont values to a company called Google, uh, building out community programs throughout the country. And I'm running for governor because our state is really struggling. Uh, we're seeing poverty rise in a way we have not seen in generations. We have a housing shortage which is turning into a homeless crisis, and we have a heroin epidemic that is affecting each and every one of our communities. And I believe that if we're going to, to tackle the economy uh, issues that we are facing, we're going to have to do it on two tracks. The first is to deal with the issues of poverty. And yes, that means actually getting our minimum wage up to $15 an hour so that no one works 40 hours a week and is still in poverty. It means investing in uh, new housing, and it means continuing down the path towards universal health care reform. But that's simply to build the platform from which we can succeed. From there, a true economic development uh, program will have three elements. The first is a stimulus piece. That's why we started with the Green Jobs Fund that would put $100 million towards making our apartment buildings more efficient putting people to work across the state and reducing our carbon footprint, and a dedicated revenue stream so we can get ahead 
on our housing building across the state and invest in a micro enterprise fund to allow people who are displaced workers to actually start small businesses and rebuild our middle class. The second is an infrastructure investment to actually bring the electricity of our time, which is broadband, to the last mile of every community. Lots of politicians have talked about it. In my job at Google, we actually did it. And I know the regulatory and the investment strategy to get it done. And the third is investing in entrepreneurs, making sure that we are creating co-work space and co-living space, having startup competitions so that we can do what Vermonters do best, which is start companies here and grow them, but also eliminating the debt that hits our young people with the Green Mountain Service Scholarship that will allow anyone who does two years of national service to be able to graduate from UVM or any of our state colleges debt free. This is an important time. We need to build an economy that works for all Vermonters and all Vermont, and together we can do this. I'm Peter Galbraith uh, from Townsend. I was a diplomat, that's why I'm trying at least for a period of time to maintain the demeanor of that with my jacket on. <laughs> uh, so I come from, on my mother's side, uh, I'm the fifth generation of my family to live in Vermont. Uh, ancestors go back to the original settlers of, uh, of um, Burlington. Uh, and on my father's side, uh, my father was an immigrant from Canada. He grew up on a farm, plowed behind a horse, gave him a lifelong hatred of horses, uh, or dislike of them, never understood why I had them. Uh, but uh, he came here, he served in the Roosevelt administration and the Kennedy administration, and was one of the leading economists of the 20th century, who's John Kenneth Galbraith, whose values uh, really are part of who I am, which is to say, uh, for a society that is uh, far more just than uh, our society was when he wrote The Affluent Society, and then it is now. Uh, <clears throat> I began my career teaching at Wyndham College in Putney, Vermont, and when the school went bankrupt, I uh, became a, a foreign policy expert and then a diplomat, the first U.S. ambassador to Croatia uh, during the war there, and uh, at the beginning, uh, po policy was not what I liked, uh, uh, and I constantly annoyed my superiors in Washington, including the president, by saying that we couldn't be passive in face of such evil. And through persistence, the policy changed. We became more active. We brought the war to an end. And I had the privilege of participating in the negotiations that ended the war in Bosnia and of being the mediator and author of the agreement uh, and signatory of the agreement that ended the war in Croatia, which was the second deadliest war in Europe since World War II. Uh, I, Ended my dip diplomatic career in Afghanistan in 2009. I came home to Vermont, uh, which had always been my home, but uh, ran for the Senate, was elected, and I suppose I was persistent there and occasionally annoyed some of my colleagues by pursuing some things that they didn't want pursued. I introduced the only bill that was ever introduced to pay for Vermont's uh, single-payer health care system. I, led the, I initiated and led the fight to try to ban corporate campaign contributions. Boy, politicians hate it when you go after their money. They like to denounce corporate money, but when you actually do it, uh, -uh. I pushed for a higher minimum wage, $12. Uh, the governor wasn't too fond of that either because he preferred a, a lower amount, but I felt that uh, you know, the higher minimum wage was the best anti-poverty program that we could have. And I got into this race uh, in March because I didn't hear these issues being discussed, and I'm pleased that they are now being discussed. But what I did in the Senate is what I'll do as governor. That is to say, push for a $15 minimum wage by 2021, uh, continue for universal health care, get rid of special interest tax breaks. Thank you all so much for being here. And it's wonderful to be in our, my community and in this place of so many memories as a parent of two kids going through these schools. It's great to welcome Matt and Peter to our community. I've been to theirs. Um, I have to tell you, it's been an extraordinary experience running for governor, traveling to every corner of our amazing state and meeting lots of people, people addressing our challenges and thinking about our opportunities. 
But what I can tell you more and more is that too many Vermonters are struggling in this economy because wages are not keeping up with the cost of living. And we need to change this story. My own story, uh, I grew up in a raucous household. I was the fourth child and the only girl, which meant I had three big brothers that liked to uh, push me around a lot, uh, tease me, they practiced their wrestling moves on me. I had to learn at an early age how to stand up for myself and to fight back. And really that's what I've been doing throughout my adult life, fighting to try to level the playing field and pursue economic and social justice in our country, in our state, in our community. I'm a working mother with two wonderful kids, so proud to have been a volunteer in our schools here, coaching soccer on those fields, serving on our planning commission, being elected to serve as your representative, then as the transportation uh, secretary and Irene recovery officer. I am a leader who brings people together to get things done. And you can count on me as governor. And I'm going to focus on three key things. First, to grow economic opportunity. And that's why I uh, rolled out my economic development strategy based on two programs. First, Invest Vermont, focusing on investment in our downtowns and villages. Secondly, Innovate Vermont, focusing on innovation in four key sectors of our economy. Second, I'm going to support working families to fight for increasing the minimum wage, fighting for equal pay, and to break down barriers to post-secondary education through offering tuition-free college two years at Vermont Community College or Vermont Technical College. That's my Vermont promise. Third, I'm going to stand as a strong environmental steward, focusing on fighting for clean water and addressing global climate change. I am a leader with the passion the vision, and yes, the experience to get this done. And I ask for your support to be the next governor of the great state of Vermont. In closing, I do want to just say that my mind and my heart is with the families of those who are mourning Ray Drake uh, at the high school this evening. And I just wanted to extend my concerns and condolences, especially to their children to his children, their family, and the many families who he touched through our school. Sorry to interrupt. I know we're out of drinks. And I just wanted everyone to know that there is a drinking fountain behind that screen. So if you need a drink of water, by all means, go for it. Thank you. Um, so the order of things this time around will be Peter Galbraith first, then Sue and then Matt Dunn. And the question is, we have finite money and big challenges. Many people believe the way we're doing things isn't working. How would you specifically solve our budget gap? So the question is, why would anybody want to do business in the state of Vermont? And the answer is, it's not because of our low taxes. We'll never compete with New Hampshire on that. Uh, it's not because of low wages. We won't compete with Mississippi. It's because it's a great place to live. And why is it a great place to live? It's because of our environmental protections and because of our public services, and, and including quality schools, health care, and that we care about one another. These things cost money. And it is, we cannot have a discussion about uh, maintaining the quality of life in Vermont and then ignore the question of how we raise the money to do it. And that's why I will tomorrow be outlining $45 million in special interest tax breaks that all of you pay for that I'm sure that nobody here in this room benefits from. If you do benefit from one of them, you're very lucky. But I'll just give you an example. The kind of things that the legislature with lobbyists puts into the tax code. We give away one point. If, if you go out and you uh, buy a, uh, a new carburetor for your car, you pay a sales tax on it. But if you're one of the lucky few who have your own private plane and you need to buy a spare part for your plane, no sales tax. We give $1.1 million to people who own aircraft so that they don't basically, in, in foregone taxes, so that they don't have to buy the spare parts. We give $600,000 to people who invest in coal 
uh, uh, technology. And I could go on. There are $28 million in special interest tax breaks. Raising the minimum wage to $15 will generate an additional $18 million. And then we give subsidies to large corporations that'll end. We gave $10 million to Green Mountain Coffee Roasters over the years. And what did they do? They moved their coffee buying business to Switzerland and lost 200 jobs. That kind of thank you is not what I'm going to tolerate as your governor. Thank you, Sue. So, yes, I think the economy and our economic challenges are really on the forefront of our minds. And that is why I have developed a very uh, focused economic development strategy around two programs, Invest Vermont and Innovate. Let me tell you about Invest Vermont. It's about investing in our infrastructure and recognizing that the public sector can, plays a critical role in stimulating private sector investment. Just think for a minute about the city of Barrie. Six years ago, Barrie was a city struggling with empty storefronts. We put a $19 million public investment into water, sewer, wastewater, stormwater, a new pedestrian-oriented Main Street. And within six years, we have leveraged over $45 million in private investment. And go to Barrie now, it's a community growing in a manufacturing, residential, retail, commercial growth. I can say a similar story for here in Waterbury, but even more for St. Albans and Winooski. That's what we can do across Vermont, strategic investment to create stimulus. Second is about innovation in four key sectors of our growing 21st century economy. Advanced manufacturing, uh, high tech, tech, and what I call the green economy, both the farm and forest economy, the incredible entrepreneurship in our ag industry, our local food movement, as well as our green energy, focusing on renewable and efficiency. One in 17 Vermonters now are employed in the green economy. We can grow these four sectors to create economic opportunity and to develop the opportunity for workers for the future by looking to the workforce, developing career ladders for next generation Vermonters and dislocated war workers to get the jobs of the future. I meet businesses all over the state that are ready to grow. What they need is the workforce to make them grow. I am focused on those four areas, how we grow our communities and how we create greater op economic opportunity for the future. So, j Just for clarity, the question is about job and balancing the budget. I just want to make sure. It's really like no one's really answered the question, so. Can you try it again? Because <laughs> I, I got lost as it went I on. I mean, there were good answers, but it wasn't specifically the question I was asking, which is how would you solve our budget gap? Okay. Well, Peter addressed yeah, it. Peter, Peter did. Raised t yeah, Peter no, did. No, well, it's basically <laughs> cutting, but, but nobody has said, like, what would you cut in the budget? Look, I, and, so, but, but you I know, wanna, that would be a nice answer if you could come up with one. Sure. <laughs> so, well, well, first of all, what I want to say is... Would you cut anything in the budget besides the tax breaks? Well, I mean, that's a cut. I mean, and I want to say, that I, Peter has done incredible work on behalf of the state as part of this campaign by going through the work that he's done. He would make an excellent in-house auditor for the next <laughs> governor, and it would be fantastic. No, seriously, the I, identity, <laughs> identifying these particular pieces is very important because we have to be looking out for every single tax dollar. We have been struggling year after year after year where we have had a deficit, we've raised taxes, we have cut programs for the most vulnerable and cut frontline workers, and yet the next year we come back with the same thing. And it's simply not sustainable. Part of it will come out, I think, of scrubbing the tax code, which I think you've outlined some great ways of doing it. I look forward to the full list. The other major driver, though, that we have to talk about is the cost of health care. It is eating us alive. The cost of health care in Vermont is going up $650,000 a day, each and every day. It is $650,000 more expensive. Now, in order to get us back on track to true health care reform, we're going to have to rebuild some trust. And part of that is going to be fixing the damn website, which we have already spent over $200 million on a failed consumer-facing website. Now, in the past, people have asked, what does having an IT background have to do with being governor? They're not asking that anymore. Because it is absolutely critical in a modern governance to have strong IT so that you can deliver services less expensively. And in fact, the area that I would look to cut in state government in Vermont is in IT. We are spending too much on 
on programs that do not actually communicate with each other. The second place is healthcare. I will fix the website, move us to funding public health rather than funding the volume of services, and then move to universal primary care so everyone gets a doctor. All the research shows that that is what will save money. Spent the last three years on the board of Dartmouth-Hitchcock Medical Center. We can get this done. Do we have a one minute? Yes, please. Okay. So thank you for clarifying. I want to say that as the Secretary of Transportation, I had a $600 million budget uh, to solve many, many difficult decisions every year about what we do and how we prioritize. It is about prioritization, and it is about uh, how we support our workforce. I want to tell you we've actually saved money by hiring more state employees, and we've proven that by looking at the cost of hiring contractors versus employees. I also want to tell you that I've been very focused on efficiency. We've actually reduced the amount of time it takes to build a bridge, and we're building bridges faster, cheaper, and smarter, saving money every time. So I also was in 2008 at the height of the Great Recession in the Appropriations Committee. That is the Budget Writing Committee. I've had to make tough choices. We'll have to make tough choices again. It's about our priorities. And I know that I will not be solving our budget problems on the backs of Vermonters who need it most. Growing the economy and getting good paying jobs and economic opportunities is about saving uh, Vermonters money because we will reduce needs for general fund services. So they are all very much related to how we solve the budget. Thank you. Peter, you want to say something else? Well, I just wanted to emphasize that tax expenditures are no different than appropriations. When you decide that you're going to cut somebody's taxes, a special interest, what a lobbyist want, you are in effect raising taxes on everybody else. The legislature, it keeps doing it. It did it this year. It, repe the, if, it repealed the sales tax that the tax department had determined should be paid by products that you acquire on the cloud. You go to Staples, you get your word processing, you pay a sales tax. You do it on the cloud, you don't. That's costing Vermonters $4 million and, it is going to, and that amount is going to increase because more and more is going to be done on the cloud. And that begins to starve public services. And there are millions and millions of dollars of these special interest tax breaks. They're justified on the grounds that they'll boost the economy. It is nonsense. They do not. Thank you. So I'm going to switch tack a little bit now because we have a lot of questions to go through. And thank you all for answering my question. I appreciate it. So. Um, the next question I'm just going to direct to one person and then you guys can rebut. And so we'll do this a few times and see how, how, how we get there. Um, if you had to name one long-term investment that the state needs to make, given our difficult, tough financial situation with this economy, um, what would it be? And, and this goes um, first to Sue Minter and then rebuttals. Thank you. I've really thought long and hard about this, and I think the most critically important long-term investment we have to make is in our kids focusing on post-secondary education. Uh, the reason is because right now we do a great job getting kids through high school, second highest high school graduation rates in the country, but when it comes to beyond high school, we are at the bottom of the country. Two-thirds of the jobs of the 21st century require post-secondary education. When we don't give kids that opportunity, they are losing economic opportunity. That They are going to have a service sector job, minimum wage job, and will be not able to break the cycle of poverty. When we give kids the opportunity for education, it's a win-win-win. Those students get an opportunity. We uh, gain economic opportunity. Everyone who gets an uh, associate's degree earns on average 12,000 more per year. Bachelor degree, 35,000 more per year. Right now, four out of 10 of our kids in Vermont are not getting that economic opportunity. So for me, it's about our future the future of educating our kids, getting them a chance for livable wage jobs so we can both grow the economy and break the cycle of poverty. That's my passion, that's my commitment, that's my Vermont promise. Of all of the things that I have been focused on, learning about throughout this state, that's the decision I've made to prioritize for the next generation and for the successive generations. Because what we also know is if you do not go to beyond high school, the high probability is that your children, grandchildren, and their children will not. 
post-secondary education now is what a high school diploma used to be. A diploma in high school isn't enough anymore, and we need to make sure that those who need it most, those who would otherwise not go on, have not just the college opportunity, but will be working with a volunteer mentor to be their champion, to get them that job, to give them that ch opportunity to make a living wage and support our economy. Okay, Matt, you get the first rebuttal. So it's actually a difficult question to answer because we have been living in depreciation as a state for so long. We have allowed our water and sewer systems to go to the point where they are failing our lake. We have allowed for uh, the, the kind of housing infrastructure we have to fall into disrepair and to be leaky and not affordable to live in and not inviting to the next generation. Uh, and we also are nearly dead last in our investment in higher education. And if you look outside of a couple of specific places like Burlington, we have some of the slowest internet connectivity. That's why in our plan, we have a number of investment areas that we have to make. I guess all of them are important. I would say, I'll just throw out broadband as a critical one because it's the electricity of our time. And in fact, if you do not have access to high-speed internet, you do not have access to the same educational opportunities, entrepreneurial opportunities, and if we do it right, we can become the telecommuting capital of the world and create an entirely new middle class. Thank you, Peter. Sue, Sue and I agree on the importance of higher education for young Vermonters, but we have a different approach to it. Her approach would be to provide free tuition for two years at the Vermont Technical College and Community College of Vermont. I am proposing to do what Bernie Sanders proposed nationally, to make education free for all Vermont high school graduates uh, for f all four years. And I will finance that by close it with just 20, it, it would cost $28 million. You will notice that I talked about $50 million in special interest tax breaks. $28 million a year will enable us to provide 8,000 Vermont high school students with free tuition for four years. This will make an enormous difference. Not only will more kids be able to go to college and take those 21st century jobs, but when they get out of college, they won't be burdened with $40,000 in debt, which will make it impossible for them, to, which makes it impossible for them to, to buy a home, and even affects decisions about whether to start a family. This is about choices and investment. Do we invest in spare, in, in, in subsidizing uh, airport, airplane parts for wealthy people, or do we invest in our kids? Thank you. Um, so now I'm going to give the big question to Matt for two minutes and then rebuttals as, as you guys want. Uh, we hear over and over again property taxes are too high. How would you lower taxes? So I want to talk about property taxes in two contexts. One is there is almost no relationship to your ability to pay and the value of your property. So fundamentally the way that we pay for education is flawed. I have had a long track record of moving the way we pay for education towards ability to pay. We need to continue in that direction, increase income sensitivity, and make sure that Vermonters are paying their fair share, but based on their actual ability to pay. The other piece, though, is the fact that we have a declining student population. We've gone from 128,000 students in about 1998 to about 78,000 students today. That is a huge drop. The other statistic, though, that isn't talked about as much is that the number of children in special ed has stayed exactly the same. So it doesn't take an education specialist to know that that cost per unit is going to continue to go up as you have that special education community. And we are just now introducing into our schools a generation of children who are born with opiates in their system. So anyone who thinks that the cost of education is going to go down is, needs to think about things in a different way because we need to address those individuals and their needs immediately. Now, that doesn't mean there aren't things we can do to reduce costs in education without hurting our schools. I am not a big proponent of immediately consolidating schools. In some places, like around here, consolidating governance when they're all going to the same high school anyway makes sense, and I'm glad the legislature gave some resources to allow that to happen. In other parts of the state, it doesn't make sense, and it can actually do harm. What I'm proposing is that we do not need 60 superintendents for 78,000 children. The way to get there is by actually rolling up payrolling, 
so that not each and every school district does its own payrolling, we can run that centrally. Same with electronic student records that each school district does. They don't even speak to each other, so we lose kids from, that have to move from school to school. We can roll that up. And then we can do assisted distance learning using video conferencing, eliminate the overhead, and keep the money focused on kids. Thank you. Peter? Uh, as a senator from Wyndham County, I couldn't help but notice that the property tax was the tax that my constituents hated the most. And I think there's a responsibility for elected representatives to pay attention to what people actually think. So in the Senate, I proposed, I, I was on the Finance Committee, I got three votes, uh, one of my Democratic colleagues and a Republican, unfortunately I needed four to pass it out of the committee, to transfer, to eliminate the pass-through of the federal itemized deductions, that would generate $70 million in income, put that into the education fund. If that had happened, there would have been no increase in property tax over the last six years. It does, it makes, it does not make sense to fund education on property tax. It's not a sustainable source. It needs to be shared with the income tax because the income tax is a tax that is linked to people's ability to pay. Thank you. So I think there really are two key elements. The first is, how do we reduce costs? The second is, how do we restructure how we pay? So reducing costs, I know this community and communities across the state have had deep discussions about school governance. And for some communities like ours, I do believe the discussion is going to help lead to single unified governance and reducing costs. We need to be thinking differently everywhere. And it isn't going to be the same approach in every community. One thing I want to say is I believe education is the most important thing we do for our kids. We need to think about never closing a school, but perhaps repurposing part of a school to get it off of the property tax, to use early childhood education, perhaps K through three, and then move to using other revenues to help support other needs in our community, like seniors who need health care, oral health care, mental ser health services, social services. So we can actually reduce property tax burdens by utilizing our schools in a different way. We also need to move further revenues into the ed fund by greater in investment from the income tax. Thank you very much. So um, the two minute question goes to Peter this time. What's the biggest barrier to a strong Vermont economy? I think the, the, the question of uh, what is the barrier to a Vermont economy, I think the, perhaps I will turn it around again, come back to the point, why would anybody open a business in, in the state of Vermont? Why did Watson bring IBM here? Because it is a great place to live. And so as we think about how we can strengthen our economy, let's get away from magical solutions. You know, some people, candidates, talk about increasing the state's population to 700,000. I can guarantee you there's no governor and no legislature that's going to be able actually to do that. We're subject to the same demographic trends as the rest of the country. Other politicians talk about bringing in wonderful, high-paying jobs. Well, I've been through 24 elections in Vermont. I think I've heard that every election cycle. You know, if it was going to happen, if it was going to be easy, it would have happened by now. And then we have what we've had in the last 10 years, policies based on giving subsidies to large corporations, usually just to stay here because they threaten to leave and then they collect public money. Let's take the IBM Global Foundries deal. And I voted against the, my last budget as a Senate over this because they snuck it in. It wasn't in either the House or the Senate bill. $5 million to support a deal between Global Foundries and IBM. Global Foundries is owned by the ruler of Abu Dhabi. IBM had $11 billion in cash on hand. It was a $1.5 billion deal and it concerned billions of dollars in infrastructure. Do you really think that $5 million made any difference? This is where our priorities are wrong. So if you uh, ask me, the place that I'm going to invest is just keeping Vermont uh, as it is, as a wonderful place to live. That's our competitive advantage. I come from a family of economists. My father, my brother is Bernie Sanders, principal economic advisor. Compa comparative advantage is, is a fundamental concept in economics. Quality of life is ours. That's what we should emphasize. Thank you. Sue, you want to go? So I've been asking that question of many Vermont businesses that I've been traveling around, and the issue that I keep hearing about is the workforce. 
as they want to grow, and many businesses are growing quickly but can't find qualified workers. I've already discussed my passion and focus on infrastructure. The next focus is workforce, which is why it isn't just about getting kids educated, it's about connecting the dots between our education programs, especially our high institutions of higher learning, and the workforce, the opportunities for jobs. In Wyndham County, they're creating a very unique and important collaboration. Business collaboration on what are the jobs that they can't recruit for, and then the institutions for higher learning trying to create the curricula to actually make sure they invest in what it is students need to be able to get an internship and a job at the end. When we connect those dots, we are gonna have the workforce of the future, livable wage jobs, and grow this economy. We have to grow the businesses that are here. We're not gonna be able to bring in great new ho white hopes. And we can do it when we work and collaborate together. Okay, Matt. So I think we are actually at a real crossroads. And I think fortunately I don't share Peter's cynicism about what we can do about it. Because I believe we do have an extraordinary state. And in fact, we've got all the really difficult pieces. We have an amazing sense of community. We have beautiful downtowns. We have more institutions of higher education per, per capita. And we have the best beer in the world. And we all know that that is key to being able to have people excited about innovation. But it's absolutely critical that we talk about an economy for the future. We've been transitioning from large-scale commodity dairy and large-scale commodity manufacturing to something else for about 40 years. We haven't thought about what the something else is. We need broadband infrastructure and cell phone service. We need to have actual affordable housing that young people want to live in. And we need to talk about the state as a place where we can create jobs for the future. I believe we can defy the trends because of where we're located, because of our entrepreneurial spirit, if we make those investments and we make them soon. So I want to um, interject a yes, no question for you, Matt, and yeah. for Sue. And that is, would you have supported um, well, ultimately, is a million dollars that went to Global Foundries. But um, would you have supported that kind of investment for that deal? The Global Foundries yeah, deal? Yeah, yes, no. You know, I've been looking at it in retrospect. Yeah. I don't think that was a great deal for Vermonters. Okay. How about you, Sue? You know, I think the um, Enterprise Fund has been used successfully to keep businesses here. Global Foundries has invested a lot in training. Uh, I would probably support that, uh, perhaps ha would have at that time. It is absolutely critical that we kept a business in Brattleboro that was ready to move across the river had they not been able to invest in the training for that business. So I actually do believe in partnership and have seen the success of keeping businesses here. We cannot uh, entice businesses, and we are in a very competitive market. When you talk to businesses who are looking across the river at some of the lower prices, so we have a disagreement there. Good, thank you. Um, I like it when you guys disagree; it's more interesting. <laughs> you were just asking specifically about the global foundry. Yeah, that's yeah. right. Okay, but you know, the enterprise fund generally is, you know, that if you want to answer well, that, look, yeah. I, I just looking at the evaluation. Because looked at it a little broader, but yeah. I'm not, I'm not sure. Well, I wasn't in the room when they were talking about what was going to happen or not happen. Yep. What I can tell you is that we're not good at going and harpooning large corporations and dragging them into the middle of the state. And I would have to see real evidence that it was going to uh, have a return for Vermonters. Uh, and so I don't take a tool off the table. Um, but my understanding of that particular deal is didn't look very good to me. Well, they okay. certainly stayed in Vermont. They were and here. a lot of jobs. They were here. They were I, I, look. They were here. Go ahead. It, it is a fantasy to think that they were going to leave over whether they got five million dollars or not. I mean, it's a one point five billion dollar deal. Uh, you know, and and what we have is companies who basically come in and extort the taxpayers of the of the state. Oh, we're going to leave if we don't get the money. This is a sucker's game. New York State pays a hundred thousand. You see the ads for New York State. They pay a hundred thousand dollars for each job they get. Frankly, they'd be better off just giving the people, the, each each worker, a hundred thousand dollars rather than engaging this kind of suckers game. So my position: no governor's enterprise fund, no no gifts to large corporations. If a company comes here and wants money, we'll do it the same way you would. Would you make a gift? No. We'll make a loan. If the company fails, okay, the loan doesn't get repaid. 
or we'll have equity participation. If the company fails, we'll lose. But if the company succeeds like Green Mountain Coffee Roasters, $10 million, the Vermont taxpayers ought to have 100 or $200 million. Instead, all it got was the company moving to Switzerland and loss of 200 jobs. It, it is a sucker's game, and if I'm governor, it will not happen. All right, then. Well, <laughs> okay. Uh, uh, well, it, you didn't, sure, quick, quick rebut. I just think it takes a governor to understand how to partner with business. I will tell you, I wouldn't want to be the governor who lost IBM. Those are intense negotiations that involve very intense commitments. And if there was uh, an administration that was not interested in supporting a training program to help Vermonters get trained for livable wage jobs, for, for, for global foundries, and that business decided, you know, we'll just stay in New York. We'll close up our shop in Vermont. I think that we would not be very happy with that governor. Okay, so I, 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 I want to look. I, this is, <laughs> we wanna, I think this is an important discussion. Okay, though. sure, so, go. So look, I, I think it's important that you have a governor who's actually had time in Vermont growing a business and been involved with a company based here, while based here in Vermont that's doing business across the country and across the globe. So that you can be able to sit across the table, understand what's being offered, what the balance sheets look like, know what to demand in an audit so that you know that what the Vermont taxpayer dollars are going towards are something that will actually get Vermont taxpayers a return. And it's very, very difficult business. It's intense. And I believe that the experiences that I have would actually set me up for doing that. And I, you know, I, I wanted to say up front, I wasn't there in the room uh, when this negotiation was going on. And there may have been information that isn't privy to everyone on it. I have to say, though, from the news reports, it didn't look like the best use of dollars, especially when we were cutting benefits to the most vulnerable in the state of Vermont. Okay. So uh, I, I want to come back because I actually think that what you really need here is a governor who is a skilled negotiator. <laughs> and I've negotiated with some of the most difficult people in the world. Slobodan Milosevic, leader of Serbia, architect of the Bosnia War. War, I mean, I've negotiated with people, and I've gone to The Hague and testified against them. And I understand something about negotiation. When they come in and they say, if, you, if, if, if we don't get what we want, we're going to bomb you, you don't say, oh, yes, whatever you want. When the company comes in and says, if we don't get your tax dollars, we're going to leave, you don't go, oh, yes, of course. The reality is you, you make an assessment. You, you, you analyze your leverage. You analyze what their decision making is. You figure it out. And realistically, if they have billions of dollars of investments, if they have $11 billion in cash on hand, $5 million is not going to be decisive. And, but the companies have figured out that we can be played for suckers because we don't know how to negotiate. And I know how to negotiate. And that's why I think I can handle this. Well, uh, shall we move on, or are we going to keep on this topic? I just have to respond <laughs> about being able to negotiate. Because let yeah. me tell you, when I was the Irene recovery officer, and the FEMA had decided it wasn't going to reimburse towns for the millions of dollars, literally hundreds of millions of dollars that they weren't eligible for. When I was the Irene recovery officer, and this incredible state office complex was in ruins and was never going to be rebuilt again, when we didn't have the ability to get the allowance to rebuild the state hospital, it took a strong negotiator, it took a fighter, it took someone who was in their face every day, every week, negotiating, discussing, and yes, coming up with solutions to get hundreds of millions of dollars to this state, hundreds of millions thanks to the work that we did collaboratively, the governor's office, the uh, office of Senator Leahy, Senator uh, Sanders, Congressman Welch, that's what I know how to do. I understand the levels of power to make sure we get in Vermont what we deserve. That's what I will be continuing to do as your governor. Okay. Wow, that was great. I don't know if we can do that again. So, uh, <laughs> I'm gonna, I'm gonna Turn up the temperature a little more. I, 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 I like these yes, no questions because yeah, right. they, they, they go someplace. Uh, how about uh, TransCanada dams? Yes or no? Uh, let's start with Matt. 
Uh, so I was actually part of the team that helped put together the offer back uh, when they were up for sale before, because we thought we would be able to get a deal on them. Uh, I am hopeful uh, we would get a deal on them again and actually have some stability in our baseload power moving forward. Um, but till, until I see a term sheet, I can't tell you whether it would be a good investment for Vermont, uh, but I would be inclined, hopefully, to be able to get to a place where it worked well for Vermont. Thank you, Sue. I'm in the same place as Matt. I need to see what it's going to cost, what it's going to deliver, what the power is going to cost, what it's going to mean to the local taxpayers uh, whose grand list is going to shrink. We need to think comprehensively as much as I love the idea. Thank you. Peter? Yes. It was oh. a yes, no question, right? Yeah. Yes, <laughs> assuming that I can negotiate, as I <laughs> think I can, reasonable terms. <laughs> uh, if we acquire the dams, we will meet, it will provide a third of our baseload. That will go us a, a long way toward meeting our uh, goal of 90% renewable by 2050. I'll tell you something else. When I was in the Senate, I joined up with Tim Ash, the progressive from Chittenden, and Vince Aluzzi, a Republican from uh, the Northeast Kingdom. And we tried to get as a condition of the GMP uh, CVPS merger for the state to acquire a 51% interest in Velco, the company that owns the transmission lines. It would have been a fantastic investment for the state of Vermont. It has an 8% guaranteed rate of return. Uh, if any of you have 8%, please let me know. If something goes wrong with the lines and you have to fix it, you just do it and you add in the 8%. It would have been terrific, but of course, we have a, gov a government that is simply too tight with the utilities, too tight with the corporations, and who are big campaign contributors, and it was ruled out. Okay, thank you. Um, so we're going to move on to health care here. Blue Cross Blue Shield has requested another increase in health insurance premiums. It's going to be about 8%. Um, how do you propose to make premiums more affordable for Vermonters? And would you keep the Green Mountain Care Board in its current form? And I'm giving this to you, Sue. Well, I think, as Matt has said, health care costs, the rising cost of health care, is the thing that is breaking our family budgets, our school budgets, and driving your property taxes, and our state budget. So it is critically important that we rein this in. I absolutely would keep the Green Mountain Care Board, but I would want to expand some of their authority to go beyond just looking at hospital budgets to increasing regulatory authority to consider, in fact, how the people are compensated. Peter loves to talk about the compensation of the highest paid individuals. But what I really want to focus on is how do we actually reform the delivery of care to reduce costs? Let me tell you an incredible story. And this is what it takes. It takes thinking much more broadly and differently about how to deliver care, how to incentivize healthy outcomes instead of the current system which incentivizes more pills, more visits, and more procedures. Think about it, a hospital makes its bottom line when all of its beds are full. We want its beds to be empty because we want people at home healthy, and that's where they need their care. I learned from one of the top administrators at the hospital that UVM uh, Hospital discovered last year that one of the cost drivers, the highest cost driver in their budget was a homeless man with, who needed insulin. He could not keep insulin refrigerated. His uh, needles were getting stolen. So how did he keep himself healthy? He would go to Church Street and collapse. And every couple of weeks, he would end up in the emergency room, and then he was back on the street, homeless. And you know what they decided? They would save costs, which ultimately reduces consumer costs and insurance rates, if we think differently and actually house that homeless person. So now our hospitals are in the discussion about how do we cut down on homelessness? Because when we can bring down homelessness, we're actually going to save hospital and health care costs. We have to think differently about how we provide health care, and we can do it with greater focus. Peter? Well, uh, Sue referred to this homeless person as the biggest driver of cost at the UVM uh, health network well, system. Example. But the biggest driver is the salary of the CEO, $1.9 million. The top 10 administrators make collectively $8 million. Now, this isn't a private company. This is a nonprofit that is supported uh, almost entirely by your tax dollars. It, it's tax dollars for Medicare, Medicaid, 
uh, Affordable Care Act subsidies and the uh, tax breaks that health care plans make. Dartmouth Hitchcock, Matt, the CEO there, makes over a million dollars, again, in a nonprofit. I mean, if we are not prepared to address the costs, and this is part of a pattern of executive compensation, which is not market-driven in the United States, it is, as my father said, uh, a very thoughtful gesture by the CEO of a company, or in this case of a nonprofit, to his most favorite person. And that has got to change. So as I mentioned earlier, the biggest driver of cost in our state is health care. And the cost is going up $650,000 a day. And we can't do it by taking small changes here and there. In 1994, I co-sponsored single-payer health care because the math didn't work then. And boy, does the math not work now. Because as long as we are reimbursing essentially for volume, we are going to be in a hole year after year after year. Uh, on the board of Dartmouth-Hitchcock Medical Center that is very committed to funding public health, we at the end of the quarter still had to figure out how we'd fill more hospital beds and have more people use our MRI machines to make our number, to make a 1% margin. That's crazy. We have to move to funding public health. We then need to move to universal primary care and then continue on the way to universal health care. If we don't do that, our premiums are going to continue to go up. And universal primary care, where everyone gets a doctor, is the fastest way to make sure you get the right care at the right time at the least cost. So thank you. Another yes, no question for the other candidates. Um, Sue, do you support universal primary care? Yes. OK. And uh, can you say yes or no and not say anything else, P Peter? No, I, I can't <laughs> say it. I'm, gonna no, say, but yes. I, I'm, I'm going to say yes. and. Unlike the other two, I've actually said how I'll pay for it, which was a with a 2% payroll tax, okay. which will cover the cost. Thank you. Sue, do you have an idea for how you'd pay for universal primary care? So what I want to say is, because you asked for the yes and no, I'm yeah. looking at both the universal primary care discussion as well as the Dr. Dinosaur 2.0, okay. which would, instead of focusing on how we pay for universal care, we would actually look at universal care for, or universal payment it, for all children up to the age of 26, increasing Dr. Dinosaur. And how would you pay for it? I don't know how to pay for it, because I don't know what it's going to cost. Mm -hmm. So. I support the concept. I want to look at both of those. Uh, we are looking at what the outcomes are going to be, what the costs are, and what the proposals are. So okay, I Matt. The answer. Okay, thank you, Matt. How would so you I pay for it? I believe there is an estimate for it, and I think it's 72 million for the universal primary care. Mm -hmm. I think full uh, universe. That was the study that came out, because part of it is that it comes uh, that a, a large amount of it will come out of existing Medicaid. Because if you're covering primary care physicians for everyone, you can actually deduct that from the cost of what you're currently paying for Medicaid, even though a lot of those Medicaid costs have, have de deductibles associated with them. The other is I would use the same mechanism for the time being that we use currently, which is a progressive mechanism uh, using payroll, so that they could actually see a reduction in their premiums that may be employer provided. And in fact, you would see not only a net wash, but in fact a reduction as we actually reduce costs of health care over time. Uh, that's what I voted for in, in 1994, uh, and that's what I would uh, push for again. Okay. Uh, I'd like to move on, if that's okay. Uh, tax revenues continue to fall. Um, how specifically would you change the tax system? And uh, I'll start with Peter. You've already addressed this a little bit, so if you could talk about other things you might change besides the tax expenditure business you've already described, that would be helpful. Well, uh, the tax expenditure uh, is a huge amount of money. Sure, but uh, let's I move mean, on. Is there other stuff you did, you'd well, do? Because you already described once, once that. You've, once you've raised uh, you know, $45, $50 million, you've, you've gone a long way toward dealing with the, with the problem. But I'll tell you the other uh, thing that I would do uh, is uh, I would look at at which I've also said, at eliminating the pass-through of the federal itemized deductions. If you don't itemize, this isn't a benefit you get. If you, if you have a super mortgage, it's a great deal for you, but if you just have an ordinary mortgage, uh, it's not even much of a benefit to you. And so if we eliminate the pass-through of the federal itemized deductions, we raise about 70, 80 million dollars in additional income, and again, then you can use that both either to 
you know, ba balance the budget, uh, although I think that won't be nece entirely necessary, because I think between that and the special interest tax breaks, you will have generated a lot of extra money. Uh, and, and you can put that into the education fund for property tax relief. The issue is not uh, whether uh, it, it, is the, it is the distribution of taxes, uh, not so much the totality. We have an unfair tax code that is really rigged in favor of large corporations and in favor of wealthy uh, individuals. And why is that? That is because, uh, and I saw this, you serve on the finance committee. It, it's not people coming in and having a discussion of uh, what, what would be a fair tax system. There, there wasn't, in fact, I was the only person in the finance committee who, who was in favor of raising his own taxes. It is a parade of people coming in and pleading either not to raise their taxes or to give them a tax break. And since the lo lobbyists have outsized influence in Montpelier, partly due to the fact that we allow corporations to finance our campaigns, something that I fought against as a legislator, uh, we end up with a tax code that is riddled with these uh, tax breaks and that is fundamentally unfair. So um, Peter brings up this idea of the, um, the, 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 you know, illuminating the pass through, right? And I guess my question about that, and maybe the other candidates might be able to answer this. I mean, how, how would this affect charities in Vermont? Yeah, so, I, you know, I th as I said, I think Peter has done a good job of bringing to light a number of the areas where I think we could actually have some cost savings that would allow for more fairness. Uh, and I am for, uh, for example, he's proposed uh, eliminating the deduction on interest on, you know, second and third homes uh, that you might have, on mortgage interest on those homes. Uh, and, you know, if Peter wanted to do that on the mortgages he has on his second and third home, he could do that. Or yours. Or mine. Uh, <laughs> or anyone else's. Uh, and I think there is a, I, I think that's actually fine. I do worry, though, a lot about charitable contributions. And having been on the Vermont Arts Council uh, for a number of years, having worked in the nonprofit sector, having supported AmeriCorps VISTA members who are out there building the capacity of nonprofits across the country, we do see that the kind of deduction that you can make uh, allows for an incentive for people to give charitably. Uh, and I know that's not the only reason that people do it, um, but it does make a difference, and uh, there, is, there is evidence to support that. And so I would not be for getting rid of all deductions uh, for Vermonters. Uh, I do think there are some areas. The, the airplane one is a new one. I think that's very interesting to look at. Uh, but I think there, is, uh, I, I, there are places where I would not go to eliminate uh, deductions. Can, can you talk about how you would change uh, taxes? I mean, you guys have all talked about investments that you want to make. Sure. In Vermont, so it's, it's actually more than just closing the gap. We, sh I think, a lot of people recognize, as all of you have addressed in one way or another, that we sh sort of have to shift our priorities um, in order to meet the needs in Vermont. At the same time, deal with ongoing budget gaps. So, um, how would you change the tax system, Matt? Well, I'll tell you. I mean, there's one thing that I would do, although I would challenge the premise a little bit. Uh, the first is, it makes no sense that a bookstore in downtown Waterbury has to charge sales tax, and someone buying the same book on Amazon does not. Right? I consider that a fairness issue, and I think we should actually go forward, as other states have, to allow for, for fairness uh, for Main Street businesses as uh, in comparison to online retailers. Um, so I think that's an area where I would certainly change it. But I'm going to challenge the premise a little bit, because I believe that if we are able to do revenue bonds, which is how we're proposing to do the $100 million green jobs fund, to put $100 million in construction jobs for both apprentices as well as construction workers, making our apartment buildings across the state more efficient, you're going to actually affect a short-term stimulus that will have revenues that will go up from the construction work and the like. And unfortunately, when we do those kinds of things, we don't actually book the resources that come in from those kinds of public works investment. And we have to, because I think that's the only way we're going to get through this trough as we do the other investments that allow for a platform uh, for growth. The other piece is, is if we address the issues around both broadband, but also doing microfinance. The success rate for doing small loans to people who are low income or displaced workers internationally have been successful for decades. But in Vermont, it's actually been successful. They've just done it with an infinitesimal budget. If we can scale that, we can bring in federal funds and actually build back an economy 
that will increase revenues. So, and to your mind, Matt, should we be spending four to five percent more a year on the budget every year? Just, just asking. So, uh, more than we're bringing in in revenues? Yeah. We need. We, I think there's two answers to that. I mean, One the, the revenue get, at we're this not point is like three percent, right? We're not so in a sustainable place. Yeah. Right. So, we're, how do we address that? We're not in a sustainable yeah. place. But if we think we're going to get through a heroin epidemic without doing additional investment, mm -hmm. we're crazy. Mm -hmm. And someone is actually not telling you the straight story because you would have to cut a lot in order to get on top of that problem. Sure, but so then you have to do a little bit Vermonters, of both. What Vermonters want is a plan. Mm -hmm. What they want is a plan. Dick Snelling set up a plan, mm -hmm. right? He actually said, we need to get from here to here. Here's how we're going to get revenues in the short term. Here are the investments we're going to make. Hold us accountable. That's exactly what I will deliver as governor. Thank you, Sue, it's all so yours. So back to the tax structure. Three things I wanna talk about. Really thinking much more holistically about our taxes. And it's very, uh, you can't just talk about taxes. We've got taxes into the general fund, taxes into the education fund, taxes into the transportation fund. All of them need to be rethought because we have several areas where we have declining revenue sources and obviously the gas tax is one I know well and have several proposals for thinking very differently about the future of the, of the transportation fund. But I also want to add on to what uh, Matt was saying about bonding because my proposals also look to bonding. He's focused um, on housing, I'm focused on clean water bonds. Uh, again, knowing that if we do not bond upfront with big capital investment, we are going to make it cost more and more down the road, as in addition to the economic stimulus that we know that that can do. We also have our general obligation bonds that I believe we can, ex that I will propose to extend beyond the current cap. And that's because we have a AAA rating that I believe we need to utilize. Interest rates will never be lower, I don't believe. And we need to take this moment to really invest in our infrastructure. But I want to mention a few other ideas. Social impact bonds. There are states, and I've been talking to treasurers from other states, who are actually getting investors from the private sector to invest in actually doing social programs that they know will, in the long run, save money by reducing costs by getting people, for example, off of opiates. And this is an area that I want to link opiate uh, treatment and, pre and renewal, uh, re recovery from social impact bonding. So we've got to think differently about our whole tax code, which was essentially built 50 years ago based on durable goods, when our economy now is two thirds of which is service economy. So we, I believe, need to think holistically and comprehensively about how it is that we are uh, taxing for all the different needs that we have. Did I go through the time? Thank you. So, um, can, yeah, before uh, we, before can I say uh, something about uh, charitable, uh, uh, because there's confusion yeah. here. Can you keep it really brief? I, I will. First, nobody's talking about repealing the federal deduction. No, no. I, we and, know what a pass through is. So, so, so it's the point is state that, taxes. But, but the, the, here's the point: is that the people who make charitable deductions get 39 percent back from the federal government. The top Vermont rate is 8.9 percent, but they don't get that. Because if they pay the additional Vermont tax, they can deduct that and they get 40% from the federal again. In essence, Vermont pays, loses 9% of its revenue, 60% goes to the wealthy taxpayer and 40% goes to the federal government. That doesn't make sense. Okay, thank you. So um, I think we're wrapping it up um, unless you all want more rebuttal. Uh, but, but it's late and uh, so <laughs> let's, let's have that two minute end. And uh, let's see, boy, how do we begin? Matt started first, right? So um, let's start with, uh, let's do um, Peter, Sue, and then Matt, okay? I'm running for governor in order to create a more fair society, one in which we invest in our children and in their higher education rather than in parts for wealthy people's airplanes. Uh, and so uh, I'm, I'm looking for a more, more fair society where if you work f a full time, you are earning uh, not uh, less than 20,000 a year, but $15 an hour or 30,000 a year. That's, that is the single most important thing that we can do 
to combat uh, poverty. It will stimulate the Vermont economy. Uh, it will uh, save the taxpayers $18 million. I don't think it's fair that taxpayers subsidize low-wage employers like McDonald's and Walmart, because that's really what happens when their employees get public assistance and get the earned income tax credit. Uh, I'm looking to clean up our politics. From Montpelier is a place where the special interests triumph so often over the broader public interest. And one of the reasons is the way we finance our campaigns. Corporations make, can, wealthy individuals can contribute individually and from all their corporations. That's why Stenger and Queros were able to give $74,000 to the governor's uh, various re-election -elec campaigns. We have a one wind developer who's given $400,000 to candidates from his various corporate entities. You know, whether you're for or against industrial wind, uh, it's surely it's not right that somebody who has that kind of interest in the state's, in, in, in the business of the state could have that kind of outside influence. I'm not running because I want to be governor. I'm running to do something as governor. You know, we've had 14 years of governors uh, Douglas, who didn't want to do all that much, and Shumlin, who made big promises uh, and, and, and then didn't do them. We've lost a lot of opportunities. We need now to move forward. Thank you, Sue. Well, I'm here because I think we have really serious challenges in our state, and I believe that we need to work together to solve them. And I have had a breadth of experiences that I believe really give me the qualifications, the skills, the vision, and yes, the experience to get things done. And I want to tell you that I believe we have to invest in our future. We have to invest in our kids because they are our future. And that includes early childhood education, as well as breaking down the barriers to post-secondary education, which is why I'm so passionate about my Vermont Promise program to make sure those who need it most have an opportunity to get the skills for livable wage jobs. I want to make sure we invest in our people fighting for minimum wage, increasing the minimum wage, expanding our paid sick leave to family leave. And I'm incredibly proud to have been the first candidate to stand up for gun safety because I know that we do have a gun problem here, and it's often behind closed doors. We have a very high rate of domestic homicides, and I want to keep women safe behind those doors. I will invest in our environment. It is so critically important. I will fight for clean water and to address global climate change. I got to tell you that the thing that inspires me is the work that we've all done together in this community. Waterbury and the Valley were really devastated after Irene. And we came together as a community. We rolled up our sleeves. We forged a vision and a path to get to that vision. Look at these communities now. Nearly five years later, Waterbury is booming. It's this place with great hope and opportunity, a mecca for craft beer. But most important, we are optimistic. And this is what I know is possible. When we come together, we can do great things. I'd love your support to be the next governor of this great state. Thank you so much for coming out. This is a very important election, as I said at the beginning, and all of your participation is going to be critical. Not only have we seen transformation on the national stage with Bernie changing democracy as we know it, but in Vermont we're going to be seeing a new governor and a new lieutenant governor, a new speaker of the house, a new president pro tem, and many new committee chairs. And the question is going to be, where are we going to go? What is going to be that new era? What is it going to be for us to come together to make change happen? And what we've seen with Bernie on the national level has been fundamental in its changing the way we talk about the issues of economic justice. But what Bernie will tell you is that his campaign is not about one person running for president, that it's a movement. And it's a movement that started here in Vermont and needs to continue here in Vermont. And Vermonters are ready. We are ready to actually move to a $15 minimum wage. 
We are ready to, do, to fix the damn website and continue on the path to universal health care. We are ready to actually make the investment of a generation in our infrastructure, whether it's our housing or it's our wastewater system. And we are ready to move into a new era of economic development, one that is about the future with broadband, with actually investing in co-work space and making Vermont an innovation capital as it has been in the past and can be in the future. This is not going to be simple. I encourage you to look at all of our websites, to look at the plans that we have presented, because it's going to be very important that you have a governor that's ready on day one to start to take action. The challenges we face in terms of poverty and homelessness are real. The fact that we have fewer young people each and every year is serious. We can actually take our state in a new direction, and together, we can do this. Thank you. Many thanks to the candidates. And thanks to all of you for hanging in there to the bitter end.